don't take that much as a memory. Keith must have done something. Okay. So as you can see, Round heads and Cavaliers, and I told the story of the round head yesterday in class. I told the story about how they that came out to be from the Americas, so they wouldn't they literally called it going native, so they would not leave. I don't know if I said this, but it was especially women. Women in the colonies would leave and join the usually the Wampanoag tribes because women were treated so much better amongst American Indians. And so much of the concept of liberty will come out of stories about the way the American Indians lived, which of course gives to a real dichotomy of how the Europeans treated them and then also how they admired their lifestyle. Dichotomy, contradiction. So, uh, finished up the video, I mentioned the petition of rights. Uh, the short parliament, the long parliament. Uh, that's how the long parliament went. And so somebody mentioned in the video, just make sure we know, you know we, knew, we saw the video of Oliver Cromwell and his new model army. I told you yesterday why they wore red uniforms, because it was cheap and they stuck with it. And you see a number of other instances of this. Uh, a little bit to the lesser degree of France, but that new, new model army. And this talks a little bit about him. And this is kind of looking down on him, him but, but he really had that idea or the feeling of a commoner. He was a Puritan, and a, a fierce Puritan. I, I found it interesting, he speck a blood or two on his collar. And, uh, but passionate. And it's hard to describe what a big deal Cromwell was. Uh, oh, I just thought this was the interesting. So you don't have to write this down, but this is the catechism. And you notice we're starting to get to the vernacular that we can understand, but there's no dictionary yet. So encouragement is I-N, because it's all kind of phonetic and just kind of thrown together. You know, the first dictionaries would not come about to the beginning of the 19th century. And you know, being courageous, um, play the men for our people and for the cities of our God and Lord for which we, which, um, See, see nothing good. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> okay, so uh, a little bit about the English Civil War. How eventually, once they got the Scottish into the war, they won. These are reenactors of the Battle of Naseby, the one they had in the video, the big victory of the Roundheads. I guess it's a big deal. I think it'd be fun to see the reenactors. But it's always funny when they show the reenactors, and those in the movie they show they're reenactors. Some overacting, but they're all reenactors. But I think it's kind of funny. They're, uh, you know, they're all probably 10 or 15 years older than what they should be. And you know, you're a soldier. You're going to be basically way for thin because you're using all your energy, and they're usually not. But what we're coming to is called. This is our new notes right here. The interregnum period, which is the period between something. For example, the era between World War One and World War Two is called the interregnum. 20s and 30s. And this is from 1449, 1649 to 1660. And this is basically the period between the end of the monarchy and the new monarchy. And it's going to be called at first the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth implies that we're all here for the common good. And then, and this is going to be, and please write this down, a republic. Back to a government by representation. That will end. And for the next almost seven years will be the protectorate and the protectorate would be a dictatorship of Cromwell. And that is the statue that I took out in front of the parliament. So now if you go, you can tour parliament and you actually can go online. It's actually kind of slick and you pick a time and you go at that time. When I went, you couldn't do that. So you just had to stand in line and I, my wife and I stood in line for three hours to finally get in the parliament. And I stared at this statue for a good two hours. Just Cromwell. And because Cromwell was in front of parliament, because Cromwell represented the parliamentary forces, the Alvis have a very mixed feeling about Cromwell. Yeah. So is the um, parliament still doesn't f like fight with the monarch, right? Because no. the monarch is like, or like Queen Elizabeth doesn't Technically, the only power the monarch really has is when the, the government falls. It's um, they have to go give the resignation to the queen, 
and then technically the queen calls an election and the, and the queen then will ask the winner the party wins that election to, to um, okay. and that's basically it but it's player war as well no no kind of like and so the, the monarch then there was a constitution monarch but the monarch had great executive power now almost done. Mm -hmm. so for yeah, example yeah. the king the king has a little bit of influence um so the king can't influence who will be the prime minister for, for the most part that never happens in fact i'm just reading about when churchill read a book about churchill's for 20 years yeah, as prime minister and a lot of people didn't want him including the king the king did not want churchill to be prime minister but had to accept him because that's kind of yeah so with that, so let's get to that. This is going to be the coat of arms. That's what the Commonwealth looked like. There's a coat of arms, uh, and that's Ireland. And they noticed they stuck Ireland in there because they're going to brutally conquer Ireland. And that's why Cromwell is despised in Ireland, as he should be, yes. When was the protector from? 15, or 1564 to uh, 1664 to 1660. 1650. What am I saying? 1664. So they went back in time, four years? 1654. Aaron, you want to just say it again? <laughs> 1654 to 1668. Okay. Yeah, this is an interesting time. By the way, some of the laws that will most impact the 13 colonies and will directly lead to the Revolutionary War will come out of the Commonwealth, which is, but that's his grasp for power. And so let's get to this. First off, in 15 or 1648, we have what's called the Rump Parliament. Remember that long parliament? Well, they got rid of everybody who was the, the new model army just came in and said it's only going to be Puritans. And so only about one fifth of the original parliament was left. That's why it's called the Rump. It's only a partial of the old parliament. And they begin a search for enemies. And that's part of what we have, the, the new model army who led the Republican forces, you know, led the roundheads. They're, they believe that this is not just a fight against royalists. This is a fight for the future of humankind. And they must root out the powers of Satan. So if you have zealots in charge, anybody who is not like the zealot is a mortal enemy. It's really ironic that the Puritans, when as years will go by over the next 150 years, they would become the most liberal and most open church. It's fascinating how that would change. Here, not at all. <laughs> and then, wasn't it like not at all in the when they colonized? Same thing, yeah. They want to create the state of the elect. The problem they have in the colonies is only so many Puritans could come, so they had to open up to other people to get more English settlers. And that would eventually lead to its downfall. In fact, the last gas where the Puritans trying to control the colonies would be called the Salem Witch Trial. And so that is when they decided it's called Regicide. We saw it in the video. The Rump Parliament decided to execute Charles. And to give you an idea what a big deal this was, even the most zealous of these parliamentar parliamentarians were worried about it. Look at the vote. Look at the vote, how close it was. Yes. So, let me get this right. Charles the First sort of indirectly fought the Civil War. Or even say directly by trying to wrestle those five members of Parliament. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, he directly attacked Parliament. Yes, without a doubt. And then why did they like him? Why was it so close? But it, it wasn't so much they liked him, it was a real thing. There's still this real feeling that a combination of he is our king. And they've grown up with a king and they expect to have it, but also they're worried this might even alienate people more and, re and start the civil war again. Gotcha. And this time then to get his son in or his brother in. Yeah. The first question I meant to ask earlier what does MP stand for? Member of Parliament. Okay. Just from what I've seen and other things and it stands for military police, and I didn't think that oh, would have meant. See, that's the thing. Uh, we, every company you know, different abbreviations. Yeah. And then you might see, for, you know, the military police and the Navy's SV. 
Shark Patrol. Okay. Just one second. So it's still working, everybody? We're good? Okay, good. So here is a very brutal picture of the beheading. <laughs> they don't mess around. One thing I like about this all, they show the model army, and even though they rarely use these weapons, these are halberds. You have a sword, a point, and a spear. They were really effective weapons in 1400, but by then they had become pretty obsolete. That's a brutal picture. Would this have actually cut off with a crown on it? Hmm? Oh, no, they took it back. Oh, because in the movie it said, like, cut his head off with the See, what happened was, in the, in the video, they had, they had, um, he had kind of a, I want to say like a, a wreath, but that's not the right word, mm -hmm. but just like a, a thin oh, thing okay. on his head, but not the actual crown. And so, while this is going on, this really radicalized. And the groups of people who wanted to get rid of the differences between the classes began to grow during this time. A more radical group of Protestants called Levelers. And more and more you'll see them really pushing for this idea that we all have liberty regardless of your wealth. Influenced by American, in American Indians. In Europe this would be called Libertarians. Now there's a political party in the United States and the Libertarian movement is a little bit different. Libertarians here are uh, mostly kind of conservative economic policy, that's their idea, so it's a little bit different. But they push this idea that everybody has natural rights. And so all, some even said men and women, but at least men should have suffrage. What suffrage? The right to vote, everybody should vote for parliament. Religious freedom. And also to alleviate the differences between the classes. And they assume with, with Cromwell, this is what's gonna happen. A more radical group of them, and this is a picture of them in a declaration from the poor, oppressed people of England, would be the diggers. And there were these farmers who were essentially like, uh, the closest they had come to would be like, they wanted to turn uh, land into common land, AKA commune, or communist. Now don't think of communists that were developed in the 19th century of the Industrial Revolution, but these are ideas that we would all share the land. But I actually covered this up, but it's in the Commonwealth though, the government of the Rump Parliament? They said, the roundhead nobility won this land, it's ours. There would be a few fights, they would be repressed, but this fear of the levelers will become a big fear for the upper class in England and also be remembered in the United States for many years to come. Let me move this picture. Let me just do this. Land for the roundheads. Oh, we're not going to cover all this. I, I had more, but I put it real quick. Okay. So let's get to the common. 1649 to 1653. It's the Rump Parliament, but Cromwell is essentially in charge. Cromwell's in charge. So it's not like the parliamentary state that would develop and the constitutional monarchy in the 18th and 19th century that they have now. There is Cromwell right there. It's essentially a constitutional republic. So it has a group of documents that make up the constitution and it's government by representation. And this is only the House of Laws of Commons. Their constitution this amalgamation of documents that they built, rolled together, would be called the institution of government. Now, this would end in 1660, but this is going to set the precedent for future governments. And the United States will use this as a role model when it would do the Articles of the Confederation and then the U.S. Constitution. Yes. So, for the whole House of Commons versus House of Lords, mm -hmm. I understand that was actually how it was when it was first formed. Oh yeah. Nowadays. The House of Lords now, and this would happen after that the law was passed in 1913, the House of Lords still meets, and it's all the nobility, but it's basically just the meet. It's just basically where a bunch of mostly old men meet. We have no real legislative power. Before 1913, they could veto measures at the House of, House of Commons. 
So it's a little like the Senate, but unlike the U.S. Senate, uh, they could initiate laws, but they could veto. So there were members of the House of Lords who were prime ministers. But after 1913, it's all the commons. So they have one house, and then who's ever the largest faction or party, their leader becomes prime minister. So the prime minister is also a part of parliament. Yes. So I have a suggestion that yeah. I think would be really cool. We're all here. So we don't change how any of the structure itself works at all, but we rename everything so that it's like modern. So we <laughs> have a King Biden, but like the King changes every four years. And then we have, instead of the House of Representatives and the Senate, we have the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The only problem with that is, you know, the word, the, the king, the term king would go to their heads. Oh, and whoever's yeah. king or queen would eventually one of them would say, I want to be king for life. But then we call the vice president the prince or the princess <laughs> now. So they're the successor. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. The prince of Wales. Okay. <laughs> so there would be an executive and there would be members of parliament that would be a council of state. And the reason why I'm saying this is these kind of existed indirectly, but have you ever heard of the cabinet? This is where the idea of a cabinet, these leading members who would deal with the day-to-day -day activities of the state. Eventually, things like law, treasury, you know, for England, it's the chancellor or the exchequer, which is still, I wish, that's one thing I wish we'd change. The Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, should be the Chancellor of the Exchequer. That would be awesome. Okay, you got me. I'm now 100% <laughs> in. And no king. No king. This is a republic. Now, there's still a lot of royalists. And there's a lot of pro-parliamentary people who are like, well, we have to have a king. And they couldn't wrap their mind around it. Uh, you'll see a similar thing when Ireland would have their number, numerous revolts, but especially after World War I. And so many people in Northern Ireland are saying, we are supposed to have a king. But Ireland itself is this, a republic. And here's the other thing. The rest of Europe, which are all monarchies, aren't they? They're appalled. But let's be very clear about it. Kings don't like the idea of civil wars that end in the beheading of the king. That sets a bad precedent. Now, this scared them. What really would scare them is the French Revolution, when they would behead the king, and basically, basically all the rest of Europe attacked France. And France did so well against everybody, that's why, to this day, everyone copies the French military. Don't, don't copy their generals, but their soldiers are very, very, very good. Can they have good generals? The only problem was their best was Napoleon, and that was 200. Geez, over 200 years ago. That's so weird to think about. You know, not, when I was a little kid, Napoleon was still emperor. So that's a commonwealth. But in 1653, Cromwell decided the rough parliament was too radical and not godly enough. And so he got rid of the rough parliament. But no one could counter it because he had that new model army who we made sure they were paid and well fed. So I love this picture for a number of reasons. Here they are in the parliament, you know, it's the dog fighting him, as, as Cromwell says, leave. And then I guess this is supposed to be a mini lion. It's a Maine Coon, yeah. So why did he dissolve it? Or like, what did they do that he said no? Cromwell had a very much of an authoritarian streak. And so then they did not want to pass laws exactly the way he wanted. Mm -hmm. Specifically, laws about Ireland and the New World. He was furious, absolutely furious. And this is going to lead to the protectors, where he literally trashed the instrument of government. I am now leader. By the way, I, I don't know how long I'm going to talk about this, but this really does fascinate me. Maybe it had to do with me sitting staring at the Cromwell statue for two hours. Fortunately, it was not a hot day. By the way, it was worth it. You got to go into the gallery, watch Parliament for a while. It was really cool. But boy, that was a long day. Dismisses the rump Parliament and declares martial law. What's martial law? Military rule. His, he becomes the military dictator, a.k.a. the protectorate of England. Ironically, 
he was very tolerant to almost all religions, especially open to a large Jewish population, many, many of them fleeing France and Spain, uh, except for Catholics, because Catholics were the mortal enemy. But they allowed for Anglicans could practice, but the other religions were allowed in, including Baptists, and a lot of Jews came in and, and would inhabit the inner part of London. There'd be anti-Semitism would rise up again. And in 1651, I know this was passed during the Commonwealth, but it would be the main element of the protectorate. They're called the Trading Navigation Acts or the Navigation Acts. Some of you, if you took American history last year, might remember these from American history. These were going to tax the colonies. And it would be the effort of Britain over the next 120 years to come up with some way to enforce the Navigation Acts that would lead to the American Revolution. That was do King George that came up with a way to enforce the Navigation yeah. Acts? King George II and King George III, yeah. And all those, remember the Stamp Act, yeah. the, uh, the Townshend Act, the Tea Act, all of those were efforts to enforce these. And ironically, it was a king trying to enforce the evil Cromwell's laws. And there would be a rebellion in Scotland again. So Scotland really assumed, now we'll be independent. If we're a republic, can't we decide our own fate? And Cromwell said, no. And the new model army devastated Scotland. So ironically, Protestant Scotland would become a headquarters of Catholics trying to come back into Scotland. We'll come back to that. Bonnie, Prince Charlie. And then, Ireland. Ireland was still technically under the control of Britain, but Cromwell expanded the area under Protestant control over around Dublin and waged war on on the very uncoordinated group of Irish not, uh, Irish noblemen and Irish peasants that were Catholic. And look how many Irish died in the next five years. Cromwell would commit one of the greatest crimes against humanity, kicking them off the land, purposely starving them. In fact, walling off, fencing off areas so people could not survive, could not eat, had no food. <laughs> Cromwell is, in Cromwell, like a lot of people, have a, a very complex history. And that's why Ireland to this day is infuri infuriated, as well, along with a lot of other, other British, of Cromwell's statue being in front of Parliament. I mean, it's a really weird thing. And this is a very startling map. The area owned by Catholics in green when the Civil War began, these are still Catholic areas. These were mostly Protestant. They, uh, a lot of immigrants from Scotland went over in the early 16th, 17th century. Have you ever, ever heard the term Scotch-Irish? Those are immigrants from Scotland who went to Ireland, and then some eventually will go to someone to the United States. Yeah. So why does, um, why does Britain still own North Ireland? Protestant. Oh, okay. Now this is Protestant-owned land. And so the majority of the population in Northern Ireland is still Protestant. But the majority of the population, vast majority of the people are Catholic, but the land are owned by Protestant lords. Does that make sense? Yeah, so did that just carry on to the day? Well, in here. Okay. But not in here, this is a republic, and the vast majority of the population is, is Catholic, even though it's a, um, there's a big shepherd's in church and state there. Not like here, but it's different. They just have different traditions, but. And uh, yeah. So they have a Dingle. king's county and a queen. And huh? a queen's county. Oh, the counties are great. This is the Dingle Peninsula, <laughs> and it's it's awesome. Yeah, Ireland, Ireland is. It, I don't know if you know this, but Ireland is very green. Okay. Here are, um, so this is an anti-Catholic propaganda of English Protestants stripped naked and tortured and sent to the mountains to starve. 
And this is to encourage Protestants to kill Catholics. Does that make sense? So here we have him going to establish that state of model Christianity. And the visible saints must prove that they are saints. So like what Calvin did in Geneva, they set all these laws in place. And so, for example, here are public notes, uh, or here's the pillory would come out. And this is what I always think about, like, like the Puritans and the pilgrims. See the pillory over there? That would be used for torture, you know, to torture people who might have broke any laws from like public drunkenness. Yep. Okay, you can see the guy right there. And by the way, that's pretty low. That hurts so bad. You can't like that even for a few minutes. And the student did that. This was the one said a few uh, when I was talking about said a while ago. And he made that, but he his before he had his big ball spurt, he got a lot bigger, but his neck was pretty small then. <laughs> so he measured on his neck, and so the neck was really small. So he, it might be hard to get a lot of people's neck in there. If it doesn't fit, we make it. But it works. Oh, I got another air filter. We got two air filters. I think we get about eight or nine air transferences an hour. It's good. Won't be much transmission at all. Almost impossible. Almost impossible. Other rooms I can't guarantee. This room with a window and these. Any volunteers? So, but if you want, we're putting someone in the stocks and like the administrators would walk in. What are you doing? That's normal. We did this years ago. Somebody made me a dunce cap. You, know those, you ever seen those dunce caps? And so we joked around about it in the ministry and everything. Now we've all started chanting dunce, dunce, dunce. And some, we put some student in the corner with a dunce cap. And they just do. And that happened. And they, all the students started chanting dunce, dunce, dunce. And I was like, oh, God. I've created a monster. OK, so. but. Here are the ones that say about the evil thing that the Quakers, a branch of Christianity, were doing. The evil Quakers. Yes, with naked children. But here's one. You catch what this is? A spell. There's no spell in it. <laughs> so, public makes more sense. That makes sense to me. The observation of Christmas has been declared to be illegal. Why? Because Christmas was a drunken seven or 12 day holiday. Remember, the big holiday for Christians is the one that the Puritans cared about, Easter. It would not be until the 19th century in the Industrial Revolution that Christian be, it is still very secular, but would become an important holiday. And why do I say it's secular? Because I, my brother has to go to, used to have to go to China a lot for work. He's an economist. And with stories about him going to China and be, seeing Santa Claus all over China. It's very secular, not religious, you know. So with that, they even banned football. I know. So this is England. So football we call in the United States soccer. And that was like big because towns. Huh? Because we're weird. Yes, exactly. And so whole towns uh, would uh, have, there were no rules. And they play soccer. And they, they were just bloodbaths. Just bloodbaths. And they'd have a big party afterwards. And they banned it. Oh, God. I mean, you get hurt now, but I mean, it was just, you know, there are no rules. So tackling, scratching, beating each other. Yeah. And whole towns would go against each other. Uh, they had another game they simply called the ball or the, or the um, race. And it was basically kind of a rugby slash football one. And it was basically just kill somebody where it was carrying the ball. There's some guys from Billings that, like, every Saturday at, like, 5 o'clock in the morning, um, come over here to Helena, and there's like a big frisbee golf tournament in Centennial Park, like every Saturday. It's the weirdest thing, but like we walk my dog down there, and there's just like all these guys. I don't know, it seems really competitive, and I don't know how from early Billings, they and they come here. Billings or Billings might not be the right one, it's probably actually great. Winnipeg, <laughs> oh. I, I bet it's great. That's interesting. Um, they're there at like 6.30, 7 in the morning. We can't have that. We have to set up a public with a K notice. Yeah, no kidding. 
I should have when I was in, uh, this happened in Germany, but also in Britain, so visiting my relatives, I, my wife's sister married a Berliner, and we're there, and the World Cup was going on, which is the craziest thing, I've mentioned this, I've told you about a little bit of that class before, it's unreal, but they are, everyone, every, watched the World Cup, and so we're there, you know, I didn't, they, they didn't have soccer when I was in high school, it was pre-soccer, also in basketball, three, three, three point one. <laughs> wow, do I seem old. You know anything about that? Good for you. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't, I don't know. Good. Sports. But for soccer, they kept asking me, well, did you play football? And I, I played American football, you know, and I'd always say, yeah, no, wrong football. <laughs> that must happen like 10 different times. Oh, you played football? Oh, great, because they're so happy. Americans, they think Americans don't appreciate football. <laughs> wrong football, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, in 1651, the author Thomas Hobbes would write a book called The Leviathan. And The Leviathan, by the way, this angry, dour man is Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes wrote this book, and in it, he laid out his very pessimistic vision of humanity. That humanity, humanity only care about power, only care about greed. And in fact, you don't have to write this down, but what he said is life is nothing but solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Hobbes. And let me say a thing about Hobbes. You know, Hobbes had this very much an attitude that most people are horrible. They're horrible people who care only about personal power. So everything is power. And so since all we care about is this, there's nothing but anarchy. I should add that he looked at what was happening in the Americas and just assumed it was savages and cannibals. He bought that law of savages and cannibals in the New World, which of course was completely false. He didn't know. And therefore, what's the only thing that will make people obey? People only obey one thing, the threat of death. And that's how I operate in my classes. The threat of... <laughs> That'd be another one if somebody was walking down the hall and hearing that. And you guys are like, oh, of course, yeah. This class should be a lot bigger. So with that, and so you need a strong man to, to tear through. You need a despot, a strong man to control the population, an iron fist. And it's always shocking to me how many people have this authoritarian streak where they want a strong man. They crave it. Probably a third of the population of the U.S. want authoritarian government. Okay, they would like to be the authority, authoritarian, but if they're not, they want a strong man. You know, the powerful man, the Leviathan, and therefore an authoritarian state. He didn't believe in divine right, but they could look out for the people. So Hobbes would have this in the next century or he would influence, I'm sorry, not happens. He would influence this idea of the enlightened despot. By the way, an enlightened despot is like saying the tall, short guy. You know, that's a contradiction of terms. And, and he did not believe in kings, but you notice he had a, a crown on. Crown represented authority. That represented authority. Yeah, he had a great influence on on Voltaire and to a lesser degree in Rousseau, Rousseau, which we'll talk about soon. He was one of them that the primer based on stuff on. Right? No. I hate maybe, based on, maybe based on, maybe based on, okay, we don't need to do this. Yeah, yeah. Let's they not were, do this. I mean, they're more uh, Locke, a little bit of Voltaire, a little bit, of, and a lot of Montesquieu. And we'll get to all of them here. And, and a little bit Diderot, we'll get to him too. And so, here's, um, here's Cromwell as Lord Protector or Leviathan. By the way, is that a good picture of Cromwell? Holding people, robbing them, um, killing the goose, the, the lady, the old golden egg. And a lot of England began to a lot for the end of martial law. It didn't take long of this iron control. And then in 1658, Cromwell died rather suddenly. His son Richard took over, but his son Richard certainly did not have the authority. 
The model army began to break down, and that would last only two years. Weak might not be the right word, because how do you compare strength compared to Cromwell? Wait, that? Huh? That uh -huh. No, he, he just died. He died in his sleep, but it so died rather it? suddenly. What? But died rather suddenly. You, they weren't expecting it. So poison is what they're saying. Ooh, maybe. Probably not, though. Because I think everybody was scared to get even near him. Well, you don't need to get near someone. Poison. I mean, she's got near her too. Valid point. And this would eventually lead to the restoration. 1660 to 1688. You don't need to write this down, but this became the attitude of people. Parliament needs the crown as the crown needs parliament. And that would be the lesson of the Civil War. They need each other. For this thing in England to work, to find that balance, you need Parliament and you need the Crown. So this is the Restoration. And now this took longer than one, but I can't help it. I'm just fascinated by Cromwell. I was like, I'm not going to talk much about, like, I want to show you a bunch of pictures of the, of the Palace of Versailles. That would probably always take longer than I think, because Versailles is amazing. I grew up in a place a lot like Versailles, in my city. So, King Charles II. Yeah. What was the point on the restoration? Yeah. Parliament and the Crown need each other. There has to be both. To their point of view. You know, this, we have that royal tradition, but also the tradition of the people having some rights. And so Charles II, he was, I'm not saying you necessarily have to write this down, but he was not like his father, Charles I. He had charm. He was clever. He did not panic. He appealed to people. He could compromise. He was not a dictatorial. He had long leggings. Yes, this was seen as the height of fashion, the leggings. I guess it's not necessarily bad, but it's just a little weird when you compare when you compare those and, and then with the rest of the outfit. And so he opened things up. He opened up the pubs. He opened up the brothel. <laughs> That's not necessarily a good thing. They brought back bear baiting. Where they would have a bear tied up, and they would bet on how long, how many, um, how long the bear could survive. Oh, it's horrible. They would, um, they, and the bear knocked the people down. It, um, you bet on the bear, and you win for it. You get money for every time the bear knocked people down. You get money if the bear cut them or killed them. But if they killed the bear relative fast, you get money if you bet on the people. Oh, that's horrible. Open things up. Shakespeare's Globe Theater did not survive this, even though he had been long gone. More religious toleration, yet he was secretly Catholic. His wife was Catholic. He had a lot of sympathy. It's, you can't really say he was Catholic. It just it's a little more complex. But don't forget what I told you: the Anglican Church had a lot of very a lot of rituals that were close to Catholicism. And so the big thing is he's not his father. So you didn't know about every detail, but the whole point is he opened things up. So Charles II, he did have that gift. But what of Cromwell? I do have to get this for the bell rings. But so what do you do with Cromwell? Cromwell died, but he had to be punished, right? You can't let Cromwell go. He killed the king, his father. So. They dug Cromwell's body up, hanged the body, burned part of the body, drawed in quarter, and hung Cromwell. There's a picture, this is a drawing of it, hung Cromwell's skull on a pike on the Tower of London. So they do, they hung him, they burned him, and they put his head on a Yeah, drawed in quarter, put his head. He had been dead for three years. But they were going to punish him. And then the plague ended. <laughs> the bubonic plague struck and killed about 25% of the population. Okay, I didn't quite get done with this, as I hope, but I'll get done with this tomorrow. I think this is good stuff. Okay, I just said the plague and beheading or sticking a, a, a corpse's head on, on a, a pipe is good stuff. There's something seriously wrong with us. All right.
So I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Yeah. You too. We'll see you. I'll break your, break your mouth, William.